My name is Jasmine Roberts Cruz, and I'm faculty at The Ohio State University. I'm really excited to share some ideas about how we can talk about social justice and how it intersects with open education. So while our conversations about OERs and open education, of course, have evolved, I would say in a short amount of time, actually, many of us are still advocating for a, a deeper discussion about how do we design our open education projects, whether that be OERs, a grant program, or an open education program in and of itself with social justice in mind. What does that actually mean? So this presentation, of course, does not serve as a comprehensive guide to how we discuss social justice and how it intersects with open education. It is merely one of the many discussions that are being had about this particular topic. So my goal in this presentation is to essentially serve as a resource, right? For those who are thinking about social justice and open education, what does that mean in light of OERs and open education programs? Again, it articulates one perspective out of the many as to how to get started on this. So speaking of getting started, let's go ahead and talk about our agenda for this presentation. So what I'd like to do first is talk a bit more about why social justice. Uh, social justice is becoming very much a part of our uh, vocabulary and open education. So let's talk about why social justice and how that differs from diversity or equity or even inclusion. Um, the second point that I want to go ahead and go into is what does socially or what does a socially just open education actually mean? Uh, not just in terms of product, but also practices and processes and even some procedures that we have to consider. And then finally, I'd like to lead you all or leave you all with, you know, what exactly can you do to get started in this process? And I want to emphasize to get started because this essentially when you're talking about social justice and open education, this is a career long commitment to this type of labor. So before I get into the actual contents of the presentation, I want to go ahead, go ahead and do a territory acknowledgement. Of course, since I'm talking about social justice, this is very much needed in this presentation. So the following are the traditional stewards of the land where the University of Minnesota is now located. You can see those tribes there. I am, you know, I'm located here in, in Columbus, Ohio, and I always say that I find it ironic that even though it's indigenous territory, it was renamed after a brutal colonizer. Um, so I mentioned that only because this is a part of the social justice labor that we are, you know, should be committed to doing when we're talking about social justice and open education. Also, sometimes I do feel as though territory acknowledgements can come across as a little performative. Not only do we need to acknowledge the traditional stewards of this land, but also how do we benefit from the theft of indigenous lands to this day? And so some of you might have heard of a project called the Land Grab University Project. And there's a journalist by the name of Tristan Autown, historian Bobby Lee. Uh, they spent about two years tracking how 11 million acres of land were taken from more than 250 indigenous tribes to essentially benefit or help fund land grant universities in the late 19th century. So we can see how, for example, the University of Minnesota actually still benefits to this day from what we're really calling an expropriation or a transfer of wealth from indigenous lands to um, university endowments. So again, this is very important to connect, you know, the foundation of public institutions to the theft of indigenous lands beyond going or beyond stating in mere territory acknowledgement. So as I previously, previously stated, I'm very pleased to talk to you all about some issues that I think many of us are you know, concerned about, many of us care about. It's been a pleasure to work with the OEN um, in some detail on these issues um, and to further their vision, which of course is to be a key player in helping the United Nations in particular achieve one of their um, uh, universal declaration of human rights as is stated here in the on the slide, which is higher education shall be ex equally accessible to, to everyone. And many of you might be familiar with this slide, but for those who are not, this kind of guides the presentation in terms of what I'm going to be talking about. And so although this language is embedded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
you know, too often I see that higher education is structured in a way that only serves to reinforce educational inequity or social inequities, right? And so because of this, this is what drives the OEN. And to be quite frank with you, this is what also drives me as an educator and a scholar. So I, I came into open education as a passionate <laughs> educator, wanting to essentially provide a better opportunity for my students in terms of how they engage with my classroom content. I did not think it was a good use of my students' time or money to assign a $200 textbook, knowing that many of them um, are coming from marginalized backgrounds. This is very personal to me because I was that college student who struggled to come up with, you know, the funds to pay for textbooks. But it wasn't just an affordability issue for me and still to this day for some of my students. It's actually being able to see themselves in the curriculum, to invite them into that curriculum making process, into that learning experience. That is another thing that drives me in terms of why I am thinking about open education from a social justice perspective. So again, how do we invite our students, invite our educators, invite all these key stakeholders into this process so that our classrooms are more socially just? So the spirit of open education, of course, prides itself on being inclusive or advocating for inclusive education, which of course um, is kind of a given, right? That is what we should be striving for. Open education is the idea that education should be affordable, equitable, uh, accessible, inclusive, and of course, socially just for everyone so that everyone can participate in this process. But like any other field or discipline or movement, there are things that we need to be aware of and that we might not be aware of because of our various different privilege that we all have in some capacity. So that is why many of us are calling to use a social justice framework, right, in order to make sure that we can have full participation in this process. And it also helps us to uh, work more productively towards the goal of advocating for a more inclusive education, equitable education. As I stated in my previous slide, when I got into open education, um, my initial conversation about it and how it was framed, it was not framed completely from a social justice angle. Um, it was more so framed from a textbook affordability, affordability angle, which of course is important and has social justice elements to it if we're talking about access, um, if we're talking about economic justice, right? So it's not to say that those elements are not important at all. But now that I, you know, I'm thinking about these issues even more intentionally, I'm asking kind of myself, my initial conversations about OERs and open education, if they had been framed from a social justice angle, would my approach be different in terms of when I created an open textbook or when I participated in an open project or open education project? Would I have asked the right questions, right, which in turn would have made the content and the entire experience more inclusive, more equitable, and more socially just for my students, especially those students who are coming from marginalized backgrounds? So it's really my belief that when we're talking about open education, especially for those who are just getting into open education, that we should try to frame it from a social justice angle. And I realize, especially in light of the racial protests that took place in the U.S. in 2020, many of us in open education are thinking about this even more intentionally, right? And so while this presentation isn't going to answer all the questions that you have about how do we center social justice in open education, it certainly points you in the direction of where, you know, you could get started. So I am a big fan of definitions, very big fan of definitions and frameworks, because for me and for many other people, it helps us to kind of know where we're going and what position we're taking along in the journey. So I think it's helpful to first define social justice before we, or social justice education, before we get into how do we actually apply that to open education. 
So social justice education can mean different things for different people, but for the most part, what social justice education is trying to do, it's trying to interrogate and address, you know, unbalanced, uh, imbalance, excuse me, uh, in power dynamics, um, the lack of opportunities that were put forth by oppressive systems, right? Um, you know, equitable distribution of privilege, so that is what social justice education is trying to address. You know, it's also as um, stated here in the slide, self-reflection of one socialization into this dynamic, right? Um, that was created perhaps by uh, oppression and uh, unjust systems and that, that create these hierarchies as well. So that's a little bit of social justice education to put it more simply, because I'm also a big fan of simple definitions here. So social justice education, I love this definition from Crystal Bell. Social justice education in a nutshell is when we try to center democracy in our classroom, in our classroom procedures, in our practices, everything that we do in the classroom, everything that comes outside of the classroom, <laughs> right? We try to center democracy in those processes um, so that enables people to truly experience their full humanity. That's ultimately the goal when we talk about social justice education. So what I also like to do, we're talking about social justice. What is that essentially made up of? So we can think about social justice in terms of five principles, right? So if we're talking about I want to center social justice in my open education project or in my OERs. Consider these five principles of social justice. These principles are addressed in you know, various different institutions and scholars. I really like how Kent State, for example, presents the principles of social justice, but this is not the only resource that talks about some of these principles here. So first, we want to consider access. So access is one of the principles of social justice. And access just basically means access to resources that could affect your ability to fully participate um, or might create an imbalance in power dynamics. So a lack of access could create an imbalance in power dynamics. So access to resources, unfortunately, in the United States um, is really predicated on factors like um, socioeconomic status, one's race, um, you know, things like education, employment, right? And so all of those factors could contribute to whether or not you have access to the resources that you need and perhaps even want. Then we have the second principle of social justice, which is equity. This is not to be confused with equality. I know they sound alike, but they are very different things. So equity refers to the effort and or resources that are really needed or required to accomplish a particular goal or outcome that should be rooted in social justice. So for example, some students in my classroom need more support or more resources or more effort on my part um, you know, compared to other students in order for them to achieve a particular goal or for order for them to fully participate in my classroom. So this is not to say, or this is not to be equated with equality, right? So in other words, same treatment does not necessarily mean fair treatment, right? So equity, again, is about the effort or resources needed for that particular individual situation. What may work for one open education program or project may not work for another one, given the resources and or effort that's needed in order to truly address the needs and the situations of the individuals or populations that are part of that open education project or OER. And then diversity. So a diversity really simply is essentially being. Right, so it's truly valuing the unique experiences, um, the unique lived experiences of many different types of people. So it's not centering one experience or saying that one experience is more valuable than the other. It's really valuing the uniqueness of um, a diversity of lived experiences. And the second to last principle of social justice, we have participation. This is not also to be in, uh, confused with inclusion. So participation is truly the opportunity or perhaps the platform that one has 
in order to participate in making policies or procedures that affect your well-being, the effectability, uh, effectability for you to participate in this procedure, right? Again, notice how this is different from how inclusion is traditionally defined, which is inviting people into a process that has essentially already been created. So I love how uh, my colleague Mahabali describes this in one of her many incredible talks. She talks about how, you know, when you're you're wanting to include people into a into a project or a situation, include people into a table, has that table already been made? Right. So that's not necessarily what we want. We want participation, which people have a say in the policies or people have a say in how to build that table. That's participation. And then finally, human rights, that is essentially the dignity that all humans have or are entitled to, I should say, in order to fully participate in the human experience in a very abundant way. So as you're thinking about your OERs or your open education projects, they really should try to address most of these principles in some form or fashion. This is not to, you know, motivate you to be perfect, right? This is also a work in progress, but essentially to provide you with some type of framework to guide, you know, those who are truly interested in making their projects more socially just. So now I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about why social justice and I really want to take this time to talk about that because social justice is different from inclusion and diversity. What we're, you know, dealing with right now is, you know, or what we're trying to strive for, I should say, is that students really deserve to be a part of a learning experience where the distribution of opportunities or resources and privilege, right, are equitable without them having to navigate unjust power dynamics and oppressive systemic structures. So social justice is really going to be the response that we need in order to help them to, you know, get that equitable distribution of opportunities, resources, and privilege. So DNI or diversity and inclusion, that's kind of a bare minimum. Right. We don't want to just settle for diversity and inclusion. Social justice is really the goal that we have in mind here. And equity is a tool that we can use in order to inch closer to a social justice outcome. Now, I am of the um, thought that uh, social justice is the outcome rather than equity, but I do want to acknowledge that there are a lot of scholars who think that equity truly is the outcome and social justice is the tool. So again, I just want to acknowledge that as well. So just another graph to kind of show you all the differences between diversity and inclusion and equity and social justice. I love this graph that draws from the work from D.L. Stewart, who is an amazing scholar uh, who talks about this in, in great detail and how it applies to education. I love some of the questions that they're asking on this graph here. So if we settle for diversity and inclusion, for example, in our projects, we are asking questions like who's in the room, whose ideas haven't be, been heard, which is good, right? But when we're talking about applying this or applying open education, some of our projects and our processes from an equity or social justice lens, we're addressing this more on a systemic procedural level, right? So again, that first line there on the slide reads, DNI or diversity and inclusion ask who is in the room, whereas equity and social justice responds by asking who is trying to get in the room but cannot. What you know form of oppression or systemic barriers keeping those individuals or that group from getting into the room? So those are the questions that we want to ask and not just who's in the room, for example. Right. And if we go back, if we go down further in the graph where it says diversity and inclusion celebrates, right? So diversity and inclusion looks at, you know, okay, how many people can we increase in this group, right? We need to make sure that these individuals are represented. Whereas equity and social justice, again, is getting more at the system, right? Um, that essentially would, or trying to create a system, excuse me, that reduce harm in those who particularly are coming from marginalized or minoritized backgrounds, right? So that is why we want to look at social justice and equity um, on a deeper level when we're talking about open education. <clears throat> 
So another reason why we want to look at social justice right, and, and try to strive for that in our classrooms and in our open education projects and what have you, is that our students are coming into the classroom with systemic issues. And diversity inclusion alone, not to say there's anything wrong with that, but diversity and inclusion alone are not going to solve some of these systemic issues. So what I'd like to do in the next few slides is kind of go through some of those systemic issues that um, you know, our students are dealing with and coming into our classrooms um, with. So OERs commonly address the issue of economic justice in the form of affordability. So it only makes sense to go into or to discuss college affordability in a little more detail. So this graph, of course, that some of you might have seen before shows the burden of paying for higher education and how it has shifted from the state to the student. So, you know, if we compare that proportion of cost, um, you know, that students had to contribute back in the 90s compared to today, you see that it's increasingly the burden is put on these students here. Now, please note that this picture might look different in your particular U.S. state. And for those who are viewing this presentation outside of the U.S., there, of course, is a different, you know, situation, a picture that, you know, we would have to consider here. But again, it's not just affordability or this issue of economic justice or injustice, I should say, that you know, uh, um, affordability or lack of affordability of higher ed causes. It's also the impact, the academic impact that you know, the lack of affordability in higher ed causes. So this slide really is a key slide uh, in terms of demonstrating the academic impact of having high cost textbooks in particular. So this data is from the Florida Student Textbook Survey. There has been multiple versions of this survey. Um, the most recent one, I believe, is in 2018. More than 21,000 students participated in this survey. And in the survey, it asked students, you know, because of high textbook costs, how has that affected your, your academic performance or your ability to engage academically? So almost two thirds of students said because of high textbook costs, um, they did not purchase the required textbook. And so if you don't have access to the materials that will help you to be successful in the classroom, that obviously is going to have an impact on your academics. A little less than half of students said that they were actually going to take fewer courses. So that affects, affects enrollment, that affects educators in terms of how many students we get to see in the classroom. There are some students who did not register for a class entirely. Um, so again, that affects educators as well. Academically, because of high textbook costs, about a third of students said they earned a poor grade and a little less than 20% said they failed the class altogether. Right? So this is the academic impact of high textbook costs as well. But it's not just an affordability issue, right? When we're talking about some of these systemic issues that I think OER is trying to address, it's also, you know, the sense of belonging. And the reason why I say that is because I want us to consider, for example, the psychological messages that we are sending students in terms of who belongs in the classroom and who does not belong in the tech, uh, classroom based upon, you know, the need to buy a $100 or $150 textbook and other factors, right, that, you know, I can't <laughs> talk about in this presentation, um, but that have some impact on uh, some of our open education projects as well. Um, so again, affordability, lack of access are just one of the many factors that affect students' sense of belonging, especially students who are coming from minoritized or marginalized backgrounds. So I appreciate this quote here from an article that reads, racially minoritized and first-generation students at four-year institutions are less inclined to feel the same sense of belonging compared to their peers at two-year institutions. A few other systemic issues that our students are dealing with and bringing into our classroom or bringing into the classroom, it's well known that, for example, enrollment gaps exist in higher education. So if we look more carefully considering race, for instance, 
um, we can see an equity still remain. So public colleges and universities, especially at four-year colleges and institutions or universities, excuse me, in colleges, uh, they do not have a representative Black population. So Wisconsin in particular, interesting enough, would need to almost triple their enrollment of Black students at public four-year institutions to reflect the state's demographics. Okay, and there are some other things that we need to consider here on the slide. So, for example, Black graduates are less likely to be awarded bachelor degrees than their white counterparts and more likely to receive associate degrees or certificates. So there are a variety of factors that contribute to this inequity that I won't be able to cover that are directly related to open education and are not directly related to open education. But this is just one example of the many systemic issues that students are dealing with. And so with all of that in mind, you know, we talked about a lot of systemic issues the, the past few slides here. With all of that in mind, it would make sense in our conversations about open education to go beyond licensing. So we talk a lot about the Creative Commons license, which enables us to do a lot of really neat things with our, our OERs, which is something that we should talk about. But let's not just leave the conversation on the topic of licensing. We have to broaden it up a little bit more in order to address some of these systemic issues that I know open education more broadly can address from a social justice angle. And speaking of that social justice angle, I like us to go ahead and consider some scholars in open education who are looking very closely about or on how we can center social justice in open education. One of the increasingly popular frameworks that um, many scholars are using to center social justice in open ed is a social justice framework created by Sarah Lambert a few years ago. Really, really like this framework. So some of Sarah's work closely examines how inclusive is open education, and she's asking some really, really, really good questions. So she's trying to figure out, and I have a quote here from her, her article, she's trying to figure out how much does open education truly serve the underserved and the underprivileged. So in her paper where she puts forth this, this social justice framework, um, she's using or she's created the three social justice principles that are applied to open education. And she draws from the work of scholars, Ketty, Young, Young and, and Frazier. And she comes up again, uh, comes up with these three social justice principles, redistributive justice, recognitive justice, and representational justice. And again, I really like how Sarah interrogates the challenges of defining something as open if we're trying to do this from a social justice angle. So in her paper in particular, she asked how open is the textbook for marginalized learners if indigenous, Hispanic, and other learners of color are invisible inside the textbook and perhaps invisible in the whole curriculum. The editing of such a textbook to include images and cases featuring more diverse communities businesses and people will be an act of recognitive justice. But what if the textbook features people of color but does not value their perspectives, knowledges, or histories? What if the textbook takes a, for example, a white colonial view of Black lives if Black lives are told solely by white voices? The development or selection of a new version of a textbook, or perhaps a new resource altogether written by people of color where they are free to represent their own views, histories, and knowledges would be an act of representational justice. So again, as you can see in open education co uh, conversations, we tend to focus a lot on trying to achieve economic justice, redistributive justice, right, which is important. But I challenge us to delve into the notion of how we can realize recognitive and or representational justice by interrogating whose stories get to be told and who gets the privilege of telling those stories. Those are the type of questions that one would ask if we're trying to center social justice in our open education uh, projects. So like I said earlier in the presentation, I'm really curious about the implications that come from decisions that professors make in their course material selections when, you know, they're assigning a very expensive textbook, 
Um, but there are other implications to consider in terms of who's reflected in the textbook. This can have such an impact on students. I know <laughs> because I was one of those students. So essentially what I'm trying to say here is focusing on recognitive and uh, representational justice helps faculty and students bring their lived experiences into the classroom, into the content, thus acknowledging that their experiences, their knowledge is valuable, is reliable, is integral to the classroom experience. experience. So this can have a powerful effect on you know, students, especially those students who are coming from marginalization or marginalized backgrounds, where unfortunately their knowledge is devalued or not valid in a way that is affirming in, in higher education. It's disappointing for students to not see their histories and heritage reflected in the curriculum. And not to mention that all students are going to be affected by this you know, uh, exclusionary situation here. So I'd like to go ahead and show you all an example of an OER that you know helps us to look at how do we center social justice when we create an, an OER, right? So this will be an example of a socially just OER or getting closer at a socially just OER. So there are a lot of um, BIPOC scholars who are doing this hard work in centering social justice in their OER projects. I want to go ahead and highlight the work of Dr. Snidely and Williams, or Dr. Williams, excuse me, out of Canada. And they created an open textbook that essentially brings Indigenous science into the fold with Western science. So essentially what they're trying to do here, what they have done, not just trying, what they have done here is beautifully demonstrated that Indigenous science is just as valuable as Western science. And I want to go ahead and read a quote from the authors that's on the slide here that reads, when we braid Indigenous science with Western science, we acknowledge that both ways of knowing are legitimate forms of knowledge. This can be an example of socially just OERs. So OERs can be a product um, solution to some of the issues that we're wrestling with in higher education, some of the issues that I kind of talked about earlier. But I found that, or I'm finding that open education can be situated in a broader conversation um, about social justice education, right? And so for the remaining part of this presentation, I'd like us to consider the process and procedure and practices um, that again, drawing from Mahabali in one of her keynotes, she talks about, you know, looking at those things and considering how do we use an, an um, social justice lens in the process, procedure, and practices in open education more specifically? So the question that I'm asking here is, what does a socially just open education mean? What does that actually mean? And I'll actually, before you, you know, get to read this, the slides here, you might have already started to read the slides. I want to go ahead and give you all maybe 10 seconds to think about that for yourselves. What does a socially just open education actually mean? What would that mean to you? For some of you, you might have, you know, been able to craft a pretty clear answer. For some of you, you might be thinking, I actually don't know the answer to that, Jasmine. I have no idea. That's why I'm here for, to listen to the presentation. Um, so these are just what I have here on the slide. These are just a few things that you can consider when you're trying to figure out what does social justice mean in light of open education. So for me, a socially just open education means that, you know, students and scholars from marginalized backgrounds are actually represented in our practices, in our procedure. They are part of that procedure and that process, particularly the knowledge creation process. So that's a given, right? When we're talking about socially just open education. 
It also involves the interrogation of any type of process or procedure that might be unjust, right? Um, so it's not enough to necessarily offer a, a textbook that is free if there is a lack of diversity within the content, if, you know, there isn't a diverse um, representation of experiences. If, you know, certain scholars who have always been called to write about said topics, the same people's voices are being centered, the same scholars, right? So it's really critically analyzing and interrogating how are we going about this process and who are we perhaps leaving out of this process because we've always kind of done it this way, for example, right? I told you all that I will be talking a lot about the human-centered approach or human-first approach in a socially just open education because that's what social justice is all about. It's trying to make sure that people have the opportunity to fully experience their humanity, right? Especially for those who have been marginalized. Um, when we talk about the um, distribution of resources and, and things of that sort, especially when we're talking about funding for open education projects, we see a lot of that funding in the global north, right, um, and equitable distribution of funding in, in other parts of the world. And as a result, we have a situation where the global north is writing a lot for the global south, and I put that in air quotes because, you know, the global south can write for themselves, <laughs> right? But essentially what I'm trying to say here is that the global north shouldn't always be writing for the global south. So how do we interrogate that, that process as well? And then all in all, what we mean when we talk about a socially just open education, it means creating products that actually meet the needs of the people that you are trying to address in your project or in your product. So another place we can better situate a broader conversation of open education and social just, uh, justice discourse is by correcting how we talk about the history of open education and acknowledging that a lot of our principles and our values, um, the idea behind open education is actually rooted in and, and scholarship that's that's kind of uh, predated <laughs> some of the contemporary scholarship surrounding open education, particularly how open education, the idea behind it is really rooted in black feminist tradition. Um, and so there is a scholar by the name of Marco Saifele Valencia who presented this you know, amazing presentation at the Open Education Conference in 2020. And I, I really appreciated their presentation because he was able to connect open education ideologies and, to the premise of Black feminist thought. So he specifically argued, and I have a quote from his presentation, um, that conventional histories and scholarly contextualizations of open movements do not connect open pedagogy to liberatory women of color feminist proxies and scholarship on education. So in other words, open education, the idea behind it, isn't anything new <laughs> in terms of interrogating the role of the classroom, right, in the broader community, interrogating institutional frameworks, policies, and procedures, putting forth questions like whose knowledge is reliable or valuable. The idea of openness truly is rooted in Black feminist liberation. Yet, those who are in open education um, know that a lot of the credit in terms of defining open education, the idea behind it, is oftentimes given to white and or cisgender um, male scholars in open education. And they're also considered the thought leaders in, in open education as well. So for me, you know, we're talking about social justice and centering it in, in open education. A question that I have is that what can be said about open education when we can actually trace the idea and practices beyond current thought leaders, right? Certainly not to discount their labor or anything like that, but it's also to center the fact that a lot of this work, a lot of these ideas we have seen before and has been put forth by scholars of color, particularly Black feminist scholars as well. And so we can see this in, for example, um, Bell Hooks, where she, she talks about teaching that enables transgression a movement against and beyond barriers. And this definitely drives my own teaching philosophy, 
we can see how this idea is actually replicated in open education practices, such as open pedagogy, the practice of engaging with students as creators of information through OER and other open practices, rather than simply being consumers of it, right? So that's, that's open pedagogy. So in other words, the transgression of boundaries that Bell Hook speaks of. So both seek to challenge the role of um, educators and students and center students' knowledge as, you know, valuable. So all in all, I'm arguing that some of these ideas in open education are not new. And if we really want to try to center social justice in open education, we need to acknowledge this instead of packaging open education in whiteness and white saviorhood. We have scholars of color who have been doing this work for a long time and are continuing to do this labor as well. Another way that we can further center social justice and open education in our conversations is through this framework that I really, really like from Mia Zamora Mahabali. Uh, they've actually been talking about this framework for a little bit now, but it was recently published. Very excited about that. It is the equity care matrix. And so essentially in this article, they argue that equity and care need to come together, especially if the goal is social justice in open education. So again, I, I like this framework because of that, but I also like the framework because it, it gets at, again, this human first approach that is so integral to social justice, especially in open education. So in a recent keynote, uh, Maha explains that, for example, if you have equitable policies, but no one cares, as is the case in the left quadrant, um, it can come across as what they're calling contractual equity or performative or even transactional equity a little bit, right? So that's not what we're trying to strive for. We're not just trying to create equitable policies because we feel pressure to, but no one really actually cares about creating the policies. It's more so of a check, we're supposed to do this, but there's no in care intentionality behind it. That's not what we're striving for. They also talk about, or Maha also talks about in her keynote, how you can have people who care, for example, um, but the labor of doing this work, work regarding equity and social justice is not equitably distributed, <laughs> right? So for example, when you have mostly people of color doing this work or women doing this work or people from the global South, um, you have a situation what that's called partial care, right? Which is on the bottom right hand quadrant. So we don't have an equitable distribution of, of labor, um, but we do have people who care about this work. So that is partial care. In the bottom left-hand quadrant, we have a situation where there is no equity. There's a lot of inequities and there isn't care regarding that. We have systemic injustice. And so we have to make sure in our open education projects, for example, that we are not just reinforcing systemic inequity by not building for systemic injustice, that's, I should say. So we're not building for equity and there's no care behind that. So that's how we can produce or reproduce systemic injustice if we don't you know, have that care and equity in mind. And speaking of having care and equity in mind, what we really want is socially just care that is in the uh, upper right-hand quadrant here where everyone feels cared for, as Maha explains, Mahana Mia, and everyone participates in this labor. So again, that is on the top right-hand quadrant. And I love this direct quote from Maha in particular. Uh, she says that it's not just important to plan a process that is equitable and or socially just, but also have people contributing to the care and making it work. Really, really like that. So we are at the presentation where many of you might be thinking, okay, how do we put this into practice? And I know we're eager to put this into practice. There's a couple of things to consider before we act. So before you engage in social justice education or social justice practices, there's a lot of reflection <laughs> that takes place. And that requires a lot of self-work and reflecting on your own socialization. So for example, as an educator, reflect on how you've been socialized in higher ed or K through 12. 
have you been socialized to believe that you are the sole authoritative figure in the classroom and the students are just knowledge buckets that you just pour into? Or are students fundamental to the knowledge creation process that I've mentioned so often in the presentation? So how, in other words, do you uphold current power structures that might contribute to uh, systemic injustice or social injustices? I get this second question or the second point a lot in the form of a question when I talk about social justice and open education. There are many people who have asked, okay, at one point do we know that, you know, X product or X procedure is socially just? It's almost like people are looking for a dream rubric. And while I actually really do appreciate that because that shows that people want to do this work right, uh, there isn't a dream rubric. Right? There really isn't because essentially, and I want to draw from this quote from Michelle Alexander, who is the author of The New Jim Crow, she argues that social justice is a process. It's not a destination. That destination is always going to evolve because we as people, we're evolving every single day. So let go of that dream rubric that you might have tucked away in the back of your head. And then people from marginalized backgrounds um, are not broken people that you need to fix. That is something that you definitely should consider when we're talking about social justice labor. So people from marginalized backgrounds or um, have been minoritized, they don't need saviors. They don't need people to center their saviorhood in this social justice labor. We need people who are going to affirm the fact that folks who are coming from marginalized backgrounds, that they have a lot to contribute, that their experiences are valuable, that they are something that we should consider um, and need to listen to. That is what we want, not deficient based views, as I stated there. And then again, drawing from the equity care matrix by Mia and Maha, this work is not just for marginalized or minoritized group. Um, it's not just for them to care about, it's for all of us to contribute in terms of this labor um, and this care process as well. So what exactly can we do? There's a few things that we can do on a very small scale level. So for example, if you are creating an open education project and you want to invite scholars from marginalized communities or backgrounds into your project, be very intentional about that outreach strategy, right? Uh, avoid tokenizing any type of marginalized scholar because they are probably already dealing with that in some capacity in other uh, aspects. Do not ask them to speak on behalf of an entire group, right? Things of that sort. If you want to invite them into an open project, has that, as again, uh, Maha states, has that project already been, uh, or has that table for the project already been created? So how can you include um, those individuals into the creation process instead of inviting them into a situation where they have no say in the policies and procedure that affects the way they participate? right? For educators, co-create with your students. That has done wonders for me as an educator. Something as simple as co-creating my attendance policy with students has increased their engagement. Co-create with assignments. Have them, you know, um, contribute to the creation of an open textbook, but making sure that not just students who come from traditionally privileged backgrounds are the ones who are contributing to this process because essentially what it just does there, this reproduces uh, injustices and, um, and, and things of that sort and inequities. So making sure, especially those students who are coming from particularly marginalized backgrounds, that they are centered in that co-creation process. Language matters. So, how, you know, we're in a situation right now where there's kind of a uh, weaponizing of language regarding advocacy and how we go about advocacy. So the way in which you even talk about social justice and open education matters. Something as simple as saying minority versus minoritized, where the latter focuses on the process by which, you know, for example, African Americans are the numeric minority in the United States, although people of color, for example, are the global majority. So focusing on your language and how you talk about social justice issues matters a lot. It matters so, so much. 
And then another thing that we can do, especially educators, is, is you know really encourage your students to interrogate the classroom and what's being talked about in the classroom, including your own teaching. And I know that's hard, right? Uh, for many of us, it's kind of hard to separate that. Uh, but that essentially again affirms that the students' feedback and the way in which they're participating in the classroom is valuable. And it also helps to disrupt some of those traditional power dynamics. So I want to show you all a few more examples of, you know, socially just OERs or those OERs that are, are getting um, better at this, this notion of socially just and open education. So this textbook here um, illustrates how open education can be inclusive and can be socially just by acknowledging and addressing disparities and inequities. So this biological anthropology open textbook was created actually by over 40 authors with a range of specialists um, with diverse backgrounds, experiences, um, specialties, ethnicities, perspectives. I mean, the list really goes on here. And the authors were motivated to create a learning resource that um, essentially supports the goal of social justice in higher education. So these author anthropologists felt that, you know, we, we really have to understand cultural differences from the insider's perspective rather than from our own perspective and refrain from passing judgment on others' cultural behaviors and worldviews. And so that's why they created, they collaboratively, collaboratively created a book that reflects essentially that belief there. And so just a few things I want to leave you with. So we've talked again a lot about social justice and open education, and a part of centering social justice and open education is presenting open as a choice, right? So that license that comes a lot with, you know, OERs, uh, that open license, I should say, um, it enables that choice, right? That people, faculty, and other individuals who are participating in openly licensing their work, they are opting into it, they are choosing it. It's not a mandate of, of that sort, right? Um, and so that is essentially, again, a part of social justice and open education. The fact that we're viewing this as a choice and that choice affirms faculty in particular, it underscores academic freedom. And, you know, there are also some culture considerations that we need to take into consideration or culture considerations that we need to obviously acknowledge. So, you know, we have to acknowledge that open isn't always the most culturally appropriate choice. But there are sometimes cultural contexts in which, you know, some things should not be open. So, again, a part of that is what we're trying to strive for when we center social justice in open education. So I'd like to go ahead and conclude this presentation. Hopefully it's helpful as you're thinking about how exactly do I design my open education projects or create an OER with social justice in mind. For many of us, when we are talking about social justice and equity, we got into this because uh, we were concerned about something, right? There is an issue that we were wrestling with that perhaps kept us up at night that really bothered us. So for some of us, it might've been anxiety, it might've been concern, it might've been anger, right? Angry at some of these systemic inequities, these issues that our students and faculty are dealing with within higher education. And that is quite a right that anger, concern, anxiety, what might've been the, the impetus of how you come into the space of social justice and open education, because anger is usually what sparks social justice labor and movements, you know, across the world. But I am of the belief that, you know, it's the love of people and the love of humanity that's really gonna sustain this labor. Because as I stated in the beginning of the presentation, Essentially, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to create a career-long, lifelong commitment to social justice and apply that in our open education uh, practices. And so with that, I hope you found this presentation very helpful in your attempts to center social justice.